we could probably start there because the first few couple of minutes is quite informal. Um, so, this picture here is not a very um, uncommon, unusual picture, right? It's a bunch of ants trying to bridge a gap between two leaves. And uh, funny thing then is, there doesn't seem to be an ant manager to say, look, I have an idea, let's hold on to each other's legs and heads and uh, make a bridge. Even though this ant leader here seems to be like a manager, but I'm sure he doesn't have a title called Ant Manager. Which brings us to our today's topic, which is the self-organizing teams. And in a moment, I'm going to ask to do a very quick survey. And before that, uh, let me take 20 seconds to explain what I mean by self-organizing in this context. It not only means just flat structure, but also uh, no job title, uh, radical transparency, everyone is decision maker, no manager, also making finance and purchase decisions, even including hiring and firing. So that's not a low bar, this is quite a high bar, right? So just for that, um, this is the context of, through which we're going to talk in, um, in today's talk. So can I ask everyone, can I ask those to stand up if you have heard the term self-organizing before today? If you've heard that, could you stand up? Yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah. As you can see, there's a little trick to pretty much get everybody to stand up, <laughs> especially after lunch and trying to keep, uh, keep people awake. So thank you for doing that. Now, no, keep standing, keep standing, keep standing, sorry. Keep standing if you have ever worked in an organization that has had at least one team that is self-organizing. Otherwise, take a seat. Just one team. So if you work in an organization that has at least one team that is self-organizing, uh, self otherwise, take a seat. You have, sorry, you have, yeah. All right, so quite a lot sitting down now. Now, the third question, keep standing if you have actually participated in a team that is self-organizing, so that you have hands-on experience. Otherwise, take a seat. Quite a few still standing, awesome. Now, last question, uh, keep standing if you have personally transformed a team from a normal team to a self-organizing team. Otherwise, take a seat. Wow, awesome. Perhaps you should do this uh, talk over here now. <laughs> um, definitely great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the participation. Yes? Could we quickly try the opportunity to start with the So, um, this is now officially starting already, so please start recording. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that it wasn't recording. Um, so, yeah, but definitely in the right audience. Thanks for that. And uh, what does that mean, right? So if we look at the whole um, research, a Gulab research, which is a very well-known research organization that has done over 30 years of research, over 30 million of employees, they found that only 13% of employees are engaged, which also means 87% of that is disengaged uh, in, in the workplace. And uh, among the 87% over here, 16% of them is not just the usual slackers. They are the ones who don't settle. They are the ones who go out of the way to make sure the business is hurt. They are the ones that you heard from the newspaper, like, you know, this one is stealing the data, that one is upsetting customer. Now, what does that mean to the business? It means a lot of loss. Uh, they found that it's up to 550 billion US dollar per year loss due to uh, their disengagement. Now, just put to, to put that in context, Indian's GDP, average GDP from 1960 to 2017, average, is, um, let me check my notes, um, 545 billion, sorry, yes, 545 billion dollars. Um, but that's not to say, um, last year, for example, 2017, uh, Indian's GDP has gone so much higher, like I think 2.3 trillion or something, but the average is about the same. So that, that's kind of like the context we're putting in. But at the same time, for organizations who have a higher engagement rate than the company's share, um, share market and trading is 147% higher. Now you may still ask, how does this relate to me, right? This is the organization. I'm not the owner. I'm not the board. How do, how do I care? This is why I bring in a picture of um, a team member I had before, Cynthia. I know there's a mask. The only reason I do that is because, you know, he doesn't feel comfortable showing his picture. But if you look closely, it's, there's an eye here. There's an eye there. So there's definitely a real picture behind that. And the, the reason I bring this up is that he his full name is Sentio Kuma uh, Kaskani. He used to work in India in a very uh, well-known organization starting with I, which name I shall not name. Um, he is an excellent QA engineer. 
um, he works very hard. Uh, and uh, the story kind of like shocked me a bit. Um, he, he goes to work very early, like six or seven o'clock, and comes home quite late, sometimes eight, nine, sometimes ten, and he has to go through all the traffic, uh, go through the metros and, you know, all this very, very crowded trains and public transport and get to work and get home and over is sweaty and etc. He gets to the work and then spend the whole day doing the work and uh, even when he goes to uh, toilet and stuff like that, he has to swap the cart so that the system knows how long you've been spending in the toilet etc. I don't know how prevalent and how true that story is, uh, but what he's telling me is by the, by the end of the day when he gets home, he was so exhausted, both mentally because of the work as well as physically exhausted that he did not have time to even talk to his wife or his son. And on the second day, he has repeated again, right? Um, so he has, it's not very energizing in the, in the way that he finally made a decision to try to um, sort of like a migrate to Australia. And that's how I met him, right? Again, I don't know how true the story that it is. But I choose to believe him and also how prevalent that is to the, to the rest of organizations of India. But the reason I brought this up is, yes, the, those numbers up here may be organization and business, etc. But it's more so to the happiness and welfare of the individual who works in the system. And that brings us to the topic of today, how a deeply troubled unit turned into a high-performing, true self-organizing team of teams. Because it not only has huge impact to the business, but also has a profound impact to the, to the, to the happiness of the uh, employees working in the organization. I mean, be, just think about it, right? Because most of us, like a majority of us, spend the majority of our days and times at work. In fact, not at family and uh, with a uh, wife and husband and children, but at work. And if the time you spend at work is not fulfilling, uh, is not like giving you the the, uh, the purpose and uh, giving you energy, then that's pretty a shit life to live, quite honestly. So if we turn this around, it would have a huge impact to everybody involved. Um, so some of you may may think, you know, is this really possible, right? Um, in a later section of this talk, I'm going to show you quite a lot of stats to show that yes, it's absolutely true. But here's a sneak peek of, um, of a quote from a quote that I heard over and over again in multiple occasions by multiple people of the team. And so if many people are saying that in different occasions, then we must be doing something right. And um, yes, move this one. Oh yeah, okay, sure. I thought I'm trying to get closer to the audience and then <laughs> in the end stop your view. So I'm probably just going to stand here anyway. So yeah, is it good? Great, thanks. Um, so, and you also probably think that is that really uh, applicable across different cultures or not? Uh, obviously this was done in Sydney, um, but what about different cultures like in India and Asian cultures, right? So to answer that question, my view is that culture is made of people. And if you look at the, uh, of the team that I was talking about, is um, just take a quick look, right? So this is India. This is me, by the way. And this is another India. Uh, is, there's India here, India here, India there, India there, India there, India there, and India here, India there, India there, India there. So majority of the development team, especially the core team, they are actually Indian people. I think 78 percent of them are from India. And so, and some of them just came to Australia very, very recently, right? So if they, these people, is able to make a huge shift. I believe that this is cross-culture as well. And I have tried this message in different countries, like, uh, like Hong Kong and China, etc. So, yeah, I would say that it would be cross-culturally uh, applicable. Quick intro of myself. My name is William Feng. And interestingly enough, my career actually started with NIIT. I'm sure everybody's very familiar with that. So over a decade ago, NIIT started the business in, uh, in Shanghai. And that's, um, that's when I, um, uh, I was one of the early employees of an IIT working with Prakash Manan. I don't know if you know him. Uh, and then after that, I um, mostly I run, went to different places and uh, mostly settled in Sydney uh, and I uh, work majorly as a, as a consultant uh, doing agile transformations across different countries uh, with com companies like McKenzie's and, and, and Bain and Company, etc. But um, beside that, I have quite a few sidelines. Uh, many people have made comment that the picture doesn't look like me. <laughs> that's because I started growing beard in past few months. So yeah, I thought, oh, that's that's pretty cool. Let me let me let me try that out. And um, um, the trigger for me to start growing beard is because I lost my charger for my shaver and said, okay, let me give it a try. And I liked it. Anyway, sideline gigs. I did uh, quite a few other things like you know, um, uh, real estate uh, investments. And I was this close in going into a development uh, of the properties, but didn't go ahead. 
you know, garments, uh, women's garment uh, business, and uh, in fact, it's like women's lingerie. Don't judge me there, but that's one of the things I did there. Um, restaurant, and also uh, personal coach and stuff like that. So as you can see, it's not, uh, I did quite a few things, but most of the things I stopped here because, um, stopped now because of the children's and kids and just couldn't handle it. So that's me. And today I'm going to walk you through the journey of how a team transfer from a troubled past to a very high performing team. And I'm going to do that in three parts. First of all, the history, top three, top three things we did, and uh, the results. So let's jump straight back in. In the first one is that the, the guys had a lot of past failures. You know, in the past four years, uh, they have spent um, over 10 million Australian dollars and, uh, uh, and didn't produce much. They were, they were supposed to replace a legacy system. And in the end, they developed a new system, but the new system is not, was not good enough to stand by its own. So in the, in the end, they end up with two systems happening at the same time. So they have to maintain both. And they're going to be sinking uh, and sink forwards and backwards. That's a nightmare. And they kept on failing on the deliverables and deadlines, etc. And hence led to the second problem that is our external environment. Because it's a government organization and the organization's uh, existence uh, depends on the funding. And because in the past they have been failing, delivering, and the minister basically said, what I'm paying for, right? I'm paying so much and give me so much time and you're not doing anything. And also, the, because it's a government organization, even though it's in Australia, the bureaucracy is still there. The red tape is still there. So it's, it's, quite, it's not a very friendly environment over there. And there was a lot of leadership dramas as well. Uh, the leaders were not very uh, competent. They uh, constantly interfered with the team, constantly changing direction. In fact, just before I joined them, uh, the, uh, one of the senior leaders um, they went away. So there's a very unstable environment over there. And extreme personalities. What I mean by, by that is um, the, the kind of people in the team ranging from total warlords, as in um, the alpha male, you got to listen to me, that kind of thing, to um, total slackers. And also we all have people from all different kind of like backgrounds uh, in terms of even some of them is mental, uh, is bordering mental illness is almost over there. And we have people with, uh, from LGBT community, nothing against them. We have lesbians as well as gay people. At the same time, we also have people who are very devoutly religious as well. So you can, you can imagine the kind of dynamics going on over there. Um, and then also team composition is also very bad. You just give an example. Right? One of the core development teams over there, they have um, three developers, uh, one tester, uh, one DevOps, and they have five architects. <laughs> I know the response would be like that. I mean, the reason for that was one of the reasons for that was the, the GM, the general manager who overseen these operations. He was an architect by trade, so he likes architects. Um, and then the other thing then is uh, within again within the core team they have two POs. Now, anyone who had any any anybody here who had any basic understanding of G, of of the whole agile uh, uh, scrum and setup you knows this is a big no nos, right? Big no nos. And they have all that over there. And as a result of the whole, whole thing, um, the team is pretty traumatized in a sense, right? There was open conversations that is very heated. There was almost like a, like a physical fight, almost, not really there, but almost. There were people fired on the spot. Uh, in fact, my predecessor was fired on the spot by that GM just before I joined. So as, as you can imagine, it's not a good environment for people to stay. Hence, the turnover is almost like 50%. And because of that reason, when I spoke to my mentor before I took the job, and he said, um, he, he happened to know this organization as well, and he said, um, yeah, it's, very, it's well and good that you want to go, it's noble for you to go and try to make a difference over there, but you know you're running too far, right? He said, I, I, yeah, I, said, I know, but he said, he said I'm, I'm standing here uh, holding a bucket of water, uh, just so that ready when you get burned and come over to me, I can put up the fire for you. So that's not a very encouraging start of a job. Uh, anyway, so... I finally decided to still go for it, and, um, and these are the three things that we mostly did to kind of turn it around. Of course, there's a lot of things we're going to do, um, but these are three main things, and also due to time, time constraint. So we're going to dive in straight away. First one, genuine, deep care of people. Now, I cannot stress you enough how important this one is, genuine, deep care of people. It sounds a bit of counterintuitive. It's not talking about productivity. It's not talking about velocity and stuff like that. Uh, why this? 
I'll explain to you in a moment why. First of all, uh, put people's personal welfare above the work. Explain that with, a, with an example. On my second week or third week in the job, a girl uh, came to me. Um, she's a DevOps. She came to me and said, I want to quit. Uh, <laughs> that's not a very good uh, start for my job, right? Especially after, uh, on my first day, I told them, I said, yes, I'm here to do help you deliver, but also at the same time, I'm, help, I'm here to, um, to look after you uh, as, a, as a person. Now, it sounds like cliche, but check with me 100 days later. Because back then, I started with a three months contractor. And so check with me 100 days later. I'm putting myself out there. I'm here to look after you. Check with me. Uh, so it doesn't sound very good, right? Two weeks later, and she says, I want to quit. <laughs> what the heck is that, right? Um, in hindsight, <clears throat> I was thinking maybe she was kind of like a testing. Right? You, you're, you're looking after me. I mean, okay, what are you going to do? So, um, so the first thing I said to her was, um, congratulations. That's the first thing I said to her. And I really mean it. The reason I, I say that is because um, she was offered, she was in DevOps, right? So she was offered a job by her previous employer, um, a, a higher position. So it's going to be a DevOps team lead, slightly higher pay, a similar kind of a family, familiar environment because it's an old organization. So that's definitely a good offer for her, right? And so I said, you know, congratulations, because that means you're valuable. And that's pretty much the same reason I want you to be here as well, right? So that's the first thing. Second thing I, the second thing I said to her was, um, I, I thank you for telling me. Now, the reason I say that is because how often do you, so when, if you decide to quit, what do you do? Do you go around and announce to the world, hey, I'm quitting, I'm looking for a job now, and, and so on and so forth? Or do you just quietly look for your work and then say bye-bye? That's what most people do, right? They don't announce that. So the fact that she come to me and talk to me about it shows that somehow, maybe somewhere, I struggle with her someone as someone that who is sort of like sincere and she can trust me to talk about it. So I thank you. Uh, her name starts with C, so C, thank you um, for, for trusting me. Third thing I said to her was, um, I, at the same time, I don't want you to leave. Because uh, number one, not only because of a technical excellency, but also because I need you as a culture warrior here. Because um, she was one of the person who, who speaks out, right? One of the reasons that she wants to go was actually because he, she was having kind of an argument with the GM, again, the evil GM. Uh, the GM wanted to decide that uh, the GM wants to do AWS code pipeline, whereas she thinks that it's not necessary, that you know, just a plain old bamboo would do the job. And so that's where the crashes come in. And, um, and so she, she kind of wanted to go. I said, I want you to stay because I'm here to create a new culture. I need people like you, as brave like you, to speak out. So I want to invite you to continue to work with me. But at the same time, though, I want you to go check out the new job. Right? So go take time off and check out a new job. Uh, if that works out for you, so be it. If it doesn't, at the same time, I still want to let you know that I don't want you to go. Please stay. So she actually did go ahead and um, about a couple weeks later, she decided to stay. So that, that's, that's a very good outcome, right? I never actually get to the chance to check with her exactly what the thought process behind it. But the fact that she stayed itself already says quite a lot about it. So that's the first example of, oh, did I go back? Sorry. Put people's personal welfare about the work. And when you do this, when you focus on this personal welfare over there, you're probably going to get this anyway. That's the point I'm trying to make. A second example, is uh, do not give up a person easily for productivity gain. This is another girl which I mentioned a bit earlier that um, almost bought her mental illness. Uh, what I mean by that then is she is fairly young and she is fairly immature and you know very very emotional, uh, goes up and down, not able to control her, her response, etc. Uh, as a result, the team is very is hating her a lot, right? And uh, it came up so strongly during one of the virtual sessions uh, that even though I knew this girl was wrong, I had, to, I had to defend her because the kind of overwhelming emotion come across is really strong. And her relationship with the team leader was also very bad. Uh, that it goes all the way up to the HR performance. Uh, they're accusing each other of, um, of racism, of, uh, of uh, discrimination. I mean, you name it. It's all full blown HR uh, issue over there. And the other thing then is, she is a contractor, so naturally the team thinks, okay, what's the point? Let's just wait for a few weeks, uh, let the, the, the contract expire, then there you go, we don't have a problem anymore. So that, that is a, a default position of we want to gain productivity um, instead of keeping the people, right? So, 
um, the thing that we're trying to do then is default position, default position for myself, both from the agile as well as from uh, from my own personal philosophy, is that you don't you don't give up people that easily, even though it's as bad as her. So I, I said, um, um, able to convince the team lead to give a bit more time. So instead, of what I do then is um, have a start to build a relationship with her. The thing is that this girl, she was very, she felt very isolated. She doesn't feel that she was trusted or being can trust anyone. As you can imagine, because there was no trust between the, the people, then there's no way you can do good communications over there. Um, so, spend quite a fair bit of time with her. Um, quite often it's over the coffee and chat like that. And uh, finally, she starts to open up and talk about issues, etc. So my theory then is, no matter how good a message you have, imagine this is a very good message. How good a message it is, how true, how 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 correct and how good it's going to be for that person, unless you build a conduit, unless you build a vehicle, then the message is never going to get across. Also a bit like, you know, passengers and a, a gift. If you want to send a gift to someone, you're going to have to find a way to send through, right? If you don't find a vehicle to deliver the gift, there's no way that gift is going to present itself, right? So spend quite a bit of time to do that. And finally, um, became, it becomes a bit of a conduit between myself and the rest of the team and her as well. So across a few, I won't go too, into too much details of that, but eventually the result is during one of the retros where we are really going to understand each other, to understand, to know each other's backgrounds, the struggles and uh, successes in, in the life, etc. It, it becomes a fairly emotional retro uh, for people and quite a few tears being shed. And in the end, which I didn't plan this at all, in the end, the team lead and this girl, they are they're literally apologizing to each other in tears uh, in front of the whole team. Oh, that's that's pretty touching moment, right? And you don't usually see that kind of things happen in the corporate world. But I'm just to show to you that this is possible. Oh, I totally didn't plan that. I myself was in tears. And by the time we walk out of the room, the, the reception was looking at a whole bunch of people who <laughs> in tears and this is what's going on here. And actually, I, I earned a name, a name for that. It's not, uh, before I um, went to the second organization, the guy then said, Hey, Will, um, my name is William, by the way, and my, ne my current organization is in Optus. And he said, Hey, don't make Optus people cry. <laughs> that kind of thing. So um, this is another example to say uh, you, you do not easily give up people. In, that's not to say that this problem has come pretty soft, right? This girl, she will continue to have a group of problems over there, there. But the team has to build a trust through which they can actually build things a bit better. And as a result, the, the girl herself has grown quite a lot, learned how to control herself. The team has also grown a lot, learned how to deal with conflicts and learned to live with each other. And this girl, she was actually a very good worker. There are days that she would just smash the work straight away. And there the, 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 the are the days that she just doesn't want to do anything. So we just learned how to manage through that. Next point is set, set expectations that we're going to know each other deeply and really do it. So this point actually con contributes to, to the other points as well. Because without we understanding each other, without this relationship, uh, you can't do any, um, any management or performance, anything at all. The analogy we can make here is that um, the time we spent in uh, know each other Build a relationship is a bit like you're sharpening your axe. So you have an axe that is not sharp at all and you're supposed to use that to cut the tree. Um, you have two options. One, you just use them straight away so that you don't lose the time. Or you spend the first hour, half an hour or so to sharpen the axe. And the time you spend sharpening the axe is definitely going to be paid back later. We all know that by nature, right? But so the time we spend together with the team to build a relationship, build trust, is precisely like uh, you spend time to shove an axe. That's definitely going to pay back. It's a bit counterintuitive, but, but that's definitely true. Be courageous to have courageous conversations. Um, this point kind of like come in tension with the first two points. First two points is about you know all caring about people, um, all bit uh, make people happy, and look at, look after people, etc. But that's not to say that you don't deal with problems. Right? You can't, can't do that. If you have problems, you're going to deal with it. A couple of examples over there is one of the team guy, one of the team, is, I mentioned about the total warlords, right? So he is definitely not listening to anyone. He's very, very um, implied, 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 implied. Uh, so very kind of like a rude to people. So you've got to have to be able to do that uh, conversation. 
I won't delve too much into that, but just to mention that you do have to have the both of that. There's another example with this, uh, with this again, this evil GM. I went into a shouting contest with him because he wanted us to use um, Jira portfolio plan to produce a gunshot like report for the project. Right? Anybody had I heard some laughter, right? Anybody who had any, any experience with Jira and portfolio planning would know that's a terrible, terrible idea. Especially portfolio plan had a very bad reputation there. So I see many laughs over there as well. So, um, but he, his head is locked in there. You know, he has to use this tool. No other options as to do it. So I went into a discussion with him and then quickly escalated into a shouting contest. Um, so much so that during the conversation, uh, his uh, secretary came in and closed the door and asked, are you guys all right? <laughs> uh, so uh, nobody dared even to do something like that. I was, I was kind of like a risk in my, my job on that one. But the funny thing then is, after that conversation, after that very robust and courageous conversation, the respect I had from this GM is actually way higher than before. So I would say, encourage you, don't be afraid to do that. If, you, if you're willing to loss your job for something, that's usually going to get you something very good. So, a um, few quotes. Whoever tries to keep it alive will lose it, and whoever loses life will preserve it. Without going into too, too, too much details of that one, I have my hashed version of uh, productivity. So, whoever tries to keep productivity at all costs, here's the, here's the key part, at all costs, will lose it, right? And whoever keeps people first, people first, will gain productivity naturally, sustainably, ongoingly, organically, and happily. Next one uh, is uh, we usually often remember that people is a problem. We all know that, right? So people is usually a problem. But also at the same time, try to remember that people is also the solution. Right. Next point, bring agile to life while well, problem solving. I think most of here it would have either coached or uh, would be working in an agile environment. And how do we bring this agile help people to adopt a new way of doing it. I found that usually training is not always necessary because it's not too hard to get people to train up. I found a far more effective way of bringing Aja to life is uh, teach them, involve them, and show them when you're faced with problem. And lo and behold, you always have problems. Some examples here. First one is what do you do, with, what do, you do when you have a total slacker in the team? I mentioned this a little bit on Sunday, and um, I won't go into too much details of how we solve that problem because that itself warrants a 30 minutes talk. Um, but in Agile slash Scrum, there's a brilliant way of dealing with that that's called stand up. Now, during usual stand up, what you do, you ask three questions What you did yesterday, what I'm going to do today, and what was, was, the, um, um, was, was the blocker. Whilst it's good, but it also it's very easy to become a fertile line for um, bearing what's actually happening, especially for the slackers, right? The slackers usually they are very good talkers. They're not necessarily good at doing, but they're very good at, at speaking. And then how easy is it for that someone to come here and say, "Oh, I did this yesterday. I did that. I had a meeting. I was working on my documentation. Didn't." Work out, had these problems, I, I was waiting for that one and I didn't get a re response and feedback, and that's me. That's it. How easy is it for, that, for, for people to say that, right? Uh, and so I call that, I call that, that verbal diarrhea. <laughs> it's just, just going on, get people all lost. Right, so, but if you, do, if you do your stand up properly, uh, there, there's no room for that. And there's a very simple trick, and that is basically divert conversation to a outcome-based communication. It's very simple. So for example, instead of saying I had a meeting yesterday, what was the result of the meeting? Right? Did you agree on something? Did you make uh, certain decisions about that? Did you, um, did you decide to not make a decision today and so that you can arrange another decision? What is it? Or the, um, another example is working on a documentation. You didn't finish documentation yesterday, but did you finish the first section? Or did you find out what the problems you need to find out? What is the result of that, right? So once you divert a conversation to that outcome-based com com communication, there's no way to hide. Now, get the whole team to do that, and then, the same, then at that point, the slacker will only have two choices. One is he continue to try to the verbal diarrhea. In that case, as you, you as an agent, 
use a change agent or, or scrum master or archer coach, whoever it is, you basically step in and respect, respectfully uh, guide that person into a, a clear communication, respectfully, right? So you can say, oh yes, okay, you had a meeting yesterday, but what was the result? You know? And it's totally fine to not have a result as well, because usually you may take a few days to get a reasonable result. I'm totally fine with that, but just call it out, that I did not have any result yesterday, I plan to progress this much today, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's the first option he has. And the second option is pretty much he has to step up and do the proper thing. And then failing both, then that person is probably going to have to think about uh, selecting themselves outside of the team, which is what's, what happened in one of the cases. In other cases, we, what happened is, uh, is that person, he, he started realizing, yeah, oh, I've been very, very busy yesterday and actually in the past few days, but I, I'm not getting any results. I need some help here, right? It's, it's probably getting someone to, uh, to, for clarification or whatever that might be. And then people start to not only do better in the stand-up, but also in better way of uh, carrying out the day more effectively. So that's just one example. Example, problem number two, not enough creative solutions and ownership. Again, this is a, when you're faced with this problem, there's another excellent opportunity for you to teach the team how to do proper uh, sprint planning. Again, I'm very sure that you all know how to do sprint planning, but do you know how to do it properly? A, a somewhat good uh, sprint planning looks something like this. A team, the product owner comes to the meeting, present with the guys about uh, the prior, prior, priorities needs to be delivered or problems to be solved, and also clearly classify, clarify what sort of acceptance criteria that might be. And at that point, throw up the problem to the team, and the whole team come together and work out a solution. All right? So that's, that's just a natural way to do it. Uh, but in this particular case, one of the team members, which is actually the uh, architect, he's very good, he's very um, dominating, kind of dominating. And uh, he pretty much domain, dominate the whole conversation of, uh, of uh, sprint planning. He comes in, he said, when you do this, do that, do this. Um, person A, you're very good at doing this, so you do that. Person B, it makes sense for you to do this. It's kind of like a doing assignments and stuff like that. So we as coach, we know this is Andy Patton. So this is an excellent opportunity for you to teach, hey guys, this is not the right way to do it. And then that's not to say when you teach them to do that, they're going to straight away and jump on it. Because in this particular case, for example, it requires the architect to step back. It requires the architect to say, okay, I'm happy to not to do what I'm comfortable with. I'm happy for the team to swamp in and do that. And so that's, not, that's not easy to do so. That's not easy to convince someone to do that. So that's going to be, again, has going to be side conversations. So in that particular case, I spent about two, three months uh, to work with the team to do that. Because on one side, you need to raise up the team to step, step in and do that. Usually, the team is very willing to do so because there's an opportunity for them to grow. But the difficult part is tell the architect to die down and step back. And that was not a very comfortable conversation. Again, it goes back to the courageous conversation again. So it does take some time for them to get over there. Another problem is may build things on wrong assumptions. Uh, it's quite it's quite possible that you spend a few sprints and, and uh, build something that's not useful. Then again, it's an excellent opportunity for you to teach the guys, hey, how do you do proper sprint review? What's the number one? Hands up if, you, if your organization is doing sprint review, having users in the room. Not many, three, four, five. Yeah, there you go. So number one thing for sprint review is you have someone, uh, end user, to see uh, what you build and give feedback. And if you don't have use in the room, perhaps you need to think about it. So that's again an excellent opportunity for, the, for, for you to teach and involve the, the team to do so. And it's a great chance uh, to start getting people uh, into customer centricity, into user testing, into sprint plan, into um, design sprint and design thinking, etc. etc. So use that opportunity to do that. Problem example four is team conflicts. Just give you a very quick view of the team conference we have recorded there, because there's a lot of names on it, so I'm going to just hide it straight away. So just to show you, there's a lot of conflicts going on, right? Then how good is an opportunity for you to teach the team using the retro to teach them how to do the, uh, the uh, team conflict in, uh, team conflict resolution? There's many ways to do that, so just use the opportunity to do so. All right. So that's just some examples I, I purposely picked, you know stand up um, with this uh, planning, review, and retro. This is very, very typical um, components of, of, um, of Agile slash Scrum. 
The point I'm trying to make then is uh, use the opportunity instead of like full on training, use the opportunity to involve them to solve the problem straight away so that they can uh, not only learn how to do it but also actually do it by learning. Um, last but not least, the point is the, the last one is let go one at a time. So, what I mean by that is uh, it's very good that the team is able to do things with your help, but it's not good enough. You need to be able to grow the team up so that they can do by themselves. It's a bit like a growing the child. Uh, you want the child to be able to do things by themselves. The usual sequence I do that is, um, first of all, I get them to be able to do stand-up very well without me being involved, so that I can do really efficient stand-ups. And then followed by spring review, because that's slightly easier. Then followed by uh, spring planning, and then lastly, spring uh, retrospective. Once a team has learned to do retrospective uh, very, very effectively and efficiently, then that's a good indicator that the team is, is very mature. You can kind of a hands off now. Few quotes. Tell me and I'll forget. Teach me and I'll remember. Involve me and I'll learn. From Benjamin Franklin. And um, give them fish versus teach them fishing. Right? You're all familiar with that, right? So, what do we need to do? We need to do this one teach them fishing so that you can get yourself out of a job. Uh, this sounds interesting, right? This is the most I live by. As someone who enables people, you go over there, uh, my success is measured by the fact that I can get out and the team can still do. I can even, uh, instead of me going out and the team crash, I want to go, I step out and the team can even on the, on the tra on trajectory of going up all the way. Right? And don't be afraid of losing your job because if you can do something like that, uh, the next job opportunity is going to line up on your door. Um, so the third point is fuel delivery with culture. Two aspects of there. One is delivery, one is culture. It's all good for you to have a bunch of people who are very, very happy, uh, but if they're not delivering anything, what's the point, right? You may as well just hang out in the park. Uh, there's no point of doing that. The even existence of the team would be in danger. But if you also just do, uh, you know, what's happened here? So, but if you also just do delivery and do not worry about people and you burn people out and uh, eventually you're going to lose it as well and nobody's, it's not sustainable anyway. So there's a beautiful combination of a culture and delivery. And when we talk about delivery, there's a few factors that affect the success or failure of delivery and that's usually, again, there's many, many ways to cut it but this is one way to show. Decision making, skill set, team ownership and purpose and success criteria. I'm going to show you very quickly just how one simple, uh, one single culture building practice can answer almost all of that question. And that is uh, culture mapping. I don't know how many of you have done culture mapping or familiar with it. Uh, it can be very long, it can be very short. And if you do properly, you usually need a bit of like a, um, a block of days to do that. But in this particular case, we decide to cross that through different sprints so that we don't take extra time. So we basically use retro time to do that. First step is that you get people to map out the symptoms, uh, which is in the blue cards. By the way, you don't, you don't have to pick a particular color, doesn't matter. So uh, get people to map out what are the symptoms that they perceived. One example of symptoms would be uh, the spring go has not been delivered. Right? Another symptom could be um, uh, our product is not uh, selling well, for example. These are symptoms that you can see usually has a business impact. Uh, and so there are quite a few come across. And then the next step, then you get people to map out what are the behaviors, observable behaviors, uh, that is leading to that particular symptom. So again, uh, for example, the spring, for the symptom of uh, spring go not delivered, that could be a lot of behaviors that contribute to that. One of that could be um, team are not showing up on time. Another one could be um, integration is not happening um, or happening too late, that kind of thing. And this itself can take up to a couple of, couple of hours to do itself, right? So we do that, and then we park it, come back next sprint, and do that again. So next step then is we have the um, uh, the white cards. Now the white cards is where it's getting a bit of uh, interesting. So we had symptom, we had uh, behavior, but then there's another thing lying behind the behavior. That's the beliefs and values and thinking, right? So on the top, on the middle. And on the bottom. So this thinking part and the, the values and belief system is the most critical and fundamental thing. If you want to make a change, you make a change at that level. Example of um, the thinking of values and beliefs behind people not coming to work. 
uh, on time enough. They may be thinking, oh, there's no need for me. The thinking might be, there's no need for me to come to work on time as, as long as I finish my job. Doesn't matter. That's, that's a thinking, right? It's not necessarily bad, it's not necessarily good, but that's a thinking. Another thinking could be, uh, we don't need to integrate as long as in the end that we can integrate at the uh, to West end. So that's a thinking. As you can see that this is where it's getting a bit of uncomfortable because that uncovers people, exposes people to thinking. Again, this exercise itself can take a long time as well. Uh, you, you can gauge on your, on, your own, um, on your own pace. Now, this is what we ended up with. Um, so I need to point out there was a spell, spelling um, error. I can't spell, that's my handwriting, but anyway, I took a picture, I can't change now. I don't know if you can read it, but if you look at this, right, so on the left-hand side, these are the limiting beliefs that we uncovered. Mistakes, I will be blamed for mistakes, and I don't want to be blamed if something goes wrong. This is the current belief, belief system. Another one is uh, decisions. Uh, uh, one of the current beliefs is I'm not allowed to question authority and leadership. Um, making decisions, I'm not authorized to make a decision on my own. You know, these are the um, current beliefs of the people. You can see it's quite courageous for people to write something down like that already yourself, right? So a bit of background, by that time, the team is fairly, fairly mature already. They, they understand each other, the trust level is fairly high. Another one is, uh, I require clear instruction or people need a constant supervision to perform. So that's the current belief system. Another one is cross-skilling cross may delay overall time frame and it's not, uh, it's, not effort, it's not worth effort. So we said, okay, these are the belief in, limiting beliefs. What are the new beliefs we want to adopt? Take a quick look at that. Mistakes are how we learn. Isn't that something that we tell our children? Mistakes is how we learn and yet we don't practice that in our workplace. And another one is rules are made by people and I'm also one of those people. All right, it's all plain things. And another one is uh, we can make and take better decisions together. Another one is we are all adults doing our best to deliver goals. So those are new belief systems we're trying to adopt. What are we going to do with this next one? This is where it gets more interesting. So the guys voted that we're going to work on something uh, to design an experiment, a cultural experiment. And they voted pretty much equally, but inside, in the end, they decided to work on this one. They decided to work on where all adults doing the best to deliver the goal. And we did a, hypo a hypothesis-driven approach. You know, what's the hypothesis? What's the things we're going to do? How we're going to measure, etc. And again, there's my handwriting uh, of the workshop itself, uh, and then uh, put down into a proper document. Just walk you through very quickly. The hypothesis is. If the sprint is clearly defined and the team gives sufficient trust and flexibility in terms of time and how, etc., then we will see increase of work ownership, productivity, and quality. It's a nice, nice hypothesis, right? And then the team work together and decide a few things they're going to do to test this hypothesis. I'm going to run quickly across, but I'm going to land on one thing. Point number three. No stand-ups. What's the reaction? At least when I told the um, Agile community in Australia, I said, we're going to have a team that is not going to do stand-ups, and we're going to call ourselves Agile, and they're going to say, forget it, get out of the room. <laughs> How can you tell yourself that you're Agile if you're not even doing stand-ups? And that was my reaction as well, first. When, uh, when the guy mentioned about this, I'm going to very quickly, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to run very quickly, all right? So, um, so, um, um, in the end, we decided to adopt that practice. Gee, I'm running out of time. Uh, so, but I was not feeling comfortable. So I said, okay, um, I'm going to have to measure you guys. And uh, the first thing I'm going to measure is what's the success criteria. We're going to, do, going to make sure the spring goal is 100% met, the velocity is going to be the same, uh, definition of done must be met, and the team MPS must be uh, positive. And also I said, I'm going to measure you everything from your interactions of everything like Slack message, how many screens. I'm going to measure you uh, how many times you're taking leave, uh, how many people is working from home, what's your usual working hours, it's less than usual before. It's pretty like, you know, um, checking how, how long you're spending in the toilet, that kind of thing. <laughs> and then what's the interactions between the people, uh, what's the creativity going down, are you having lunch together or not? I'm surveying them. I'm like a security surveying them. But I told them this is what I'm doing because I don't feel comfortable. 
And also, I've listed down a lot of uh, concerns, the concerns of not having daily stand-ups. I list down all of them, 12 of them, a uh, very um, likelihood of that, what are the things we can do. As you can see, I was not feeling comfortable with that, but I was willing to let, uh, let, uh, give that a try. And then, uh, very quick results. On the first sprint, of the, after this uh, cultural experiment, the sprint goal was 100% met, velocity jumped to 110, and the definition is done all met, the MPS is plus 82. I did not believe it. Right? I'm going to cover it in, the, in a moment. And then sprint two, dropped down a bit further, uh, dropped down a lot because some of the tickets did not get finished. Some of the stories did not get finished. But then on the sprint three, it bounced up back again as well. Overall results is phenomenal. The guys really loved it. They, they're buzzing together. They are delivering and smashing it. And uh, so the point then is, if we just look at the whole um, one single exercise, we already addressed decision making because talking about, you know, we want to make good decisions together. We're talking about cross scaling. We're talking about team ownership is through the roof. And uh, there's only one thing that didn't cover here, but it covered someone else. So the point is, culture is real. Culture is everything. Culture produces lasting results. Speaking of results, these are the MPS scores we had before. Uh, before the cultural experiment is very low, uh, but that's normal. But right after this, it's jumped hugely, which I did not believe. I said, guys, you're gaming it. They're saying, no, I'm not gaming it. So, uh, so we'll continue to measure and all the way up, sometimes drop down, sometimes goes up, but overall it's really good. And these are the, some of the productivity games. I'm not going to go into too much details, uh, but what I'm trying to point out then is in about 10 sprints time, the productivity jumped 163% to almost more than double, right? Um, and um, this is only 10 sprints which we are running on weekly, so this is over two months of time. And that actually produced a lot of results. Here's a letter from the GM, the same evil <laughs> GM, uh, upon a, a deliverable, it says, momentous achievement. I can't tell you how proud I'm of you. We have matured as a team into the past, in, in the past while, and we truly are entering a new era together. Uh, this is a very strong word, and nobody has ever seen an email like that from a GM. So it's quite uh, astonishing. There's another email from a service director um, that says, we're looking, so we, we got the reputation looking for the government and uh, commercial sector, which then uh, means the, um, the money, etc., and they actually get secured funding for the next five years. Here's another letter, I'm going to skip that. The other thing they mentioned is that 14 promotions out of 50 people, that's 30% of promotion rate, I personally have never seen anywhere over there. So this is awesome people growth. Um, the attrition rate was down to 6%, which is very low, it's about three people. Here is a bit of failure over there because that one sub team, three of them resigned within the same, pretty much the same week. And that's due to a different reason we're gonna go into. But among the three people who resigned, one of them actually came back. Uh, as you, we can see over here, the niche came back, the niche back on board because <laughs> We grew the culture in over a period of time. People don't actually see, feel that much. It's not until they went somewhere else, they could find out, oh, shit, I should have left. I didn't know how good it was. So he, he decided to come back and we said, of course we'll come back. So that's one thing. The, the second person who resigned, uh, he wanted to come back, but he couldn't. And the third person who did not want to come back, she, he was actually one of the person who said the quote I had in the beginning, that you know this is the best thing I will work with. So that's civil lining over there even. Um, as a managerless team over there, um, this is actually the real picture, right? So the real picture of the person, especially this one, Damien, he has grown himself into a self-educating himself into a technical expertise. And uh, they really, the, the, team, the team lead um, decided to take a 12 month tour of Australia. So he just, she decided to quit the job and the team decided to, we don't need the manager anymore. Right, it's, that's not a reflection of the of the manager's job. He he does a very good job, um, but that's a true self-managing team over there. And to to just give you a bit of context over there, we have about fifty people uh, with four teams, and we don't have uh, scrum master, we don't have project manager, we don't have program manager. Uh, it's pretty much just myself and the rest of the team. The only way we're able to do so is by growing team to a mature level that they don't need inputs anymore. So that's itself, it's a testimony of that. Yeah, finishing very soon. Here's an, a chart showing the team, the self-managing, and it's referring to short stuff. That's what it meant, the, the manager down over there. If we can do it, I can do it in a government organization, you can do it too. So three simple points. Number one, choose people over work every time, care to yourself. Allow me 30 seconds to explain this. 
It sounds counterintuitive. It sounds they are not focused on productivity, but the world is entering in the where in in an era well where people is really being the centre, and um, and if you are the you, if you are the ones who is able to overcome the the intuition to step into space where you really care about people, care to the soul level, you will be the real leader, true leader in the future. Second point is don't do it for them. Show, involve, make them better than yourselves. Like, like grow your children. Third one is relentlessly hunt the culture DNA and transfer from there. Do not work on the symptom level. Do not work on the behavior level. Go down to the root cause. Go down to the beliefs and value system and change from there. Change the individual, change the team, change an organization, change the world. Thank you very much. Do you still have time for questions or? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I was, I was going very fast. But if you have any questions, I'll be staying around and I'm very happy to answer any of those. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks. Whew. Not bad. Um,